average age of an advisor, a financial advisor, is about 60. Is that right? Yeah. Welcome to Founders in 15. I have here today with me Tyler Matthews, who is the uh, founder, CEO of uh, Farder. <laughs> there you go. And um, uh, we've known each other now for a few years. And I remember uh, our first meeting, you, uh, you came in to our offices with Brett, your co-founder. That's right. And you and Brett were telling me about this, this idea of what is wealth management is going to look like for your generation and your purpose uh, for Farder. Um, before we get into Farder, why don't we start off with maybe a bit of your background, uh, also Brett's background. Sure. You know, how did you guys met? How did you guys come together? What motivated you to get started? Yeah. That uh, would be great. Well, uh, you know, so my background, uh, you know, real, real quick in a nutshell, grew up in Richmond, Virginia. So, uh, you know, public school educated, uh, I was uh, an athlete, so I, I was lucky, lucky enough to get the opportunity to go to Yale as an uh, undergrad. Uh, philosophy major, so naturally I went into investment banking, as, as you do. Um, and that was real, really my first taste of the, you know, the finance industry. Um, the financial crisis claimed my bank, so uh, I fairly quickly transitioned into management consulting over at uh, Fidelity Investments. First introduction to the asset management industry. And I uh, got you know, really broad exposure there to you know, just about everything that you could hope to uh, in the wealth management space. Um, I went to business school at MIT explicitly to do something entrepreneurial. And I ended up doing something wildly different from pretty much anything else that I'd, you know, I'd ever considered. It's a social enterprise in southern India. Um, so tech for development products uh, are, are really hard to distribute. And uh, there, there was an opportunity to be that distributor for, for those sorts of products there. Mm -hmm. um, so I founded that company. I actually moved out there with um, you know, to the other co-founders. And um, how long were you there? About a year. About a year. Uh, yeah. So I lived in Bangalore uh, and spent about half of my time in in kind of the uh, tier three, tier four cities in um, in Tamil Nadu, which is the uh, southernmost. Uh, state of India. That's interesting. Yeah. Uh, I want to know more about that experience. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's it's a, a long, fun story and uh, just a fantastic experience to to, uh, to do something different and yeah. to see a different part of the world than I otherwise would have ever been exposed to. Mm -hmm. um, but it wasn't a very good long-term situation for me. My uh, my then girlfriend, now wife, uh, had her own career, and um, biotech is concentrated here in the states. So we I, I came back. Um, uh, moved to Boston and got married, and then uh, later uh, joined the fintech industry out here in San Francisco in about 2016. Uh, 2016, that's right. And that was really the uh, you know kind of the uh, what set me on the path to founding Farther was you know my experience and uh, seeing just how much uh, how much opportunity there was. What was it, what was it that triggered you? You said, okay, I'm doing this. So uh, maybe a little background on my, my role at uh, this, the company was called Forest Hall. Um, so venture back company, I joined when they had about $25 million under management, uh, helped grow that company to about a billion dollars. So I saw that hyper growth phase, uh, mm -hmm. which is super, super exciting. Um, but I also got to see uh, how, wh where innovation was in the space uh, and where it wasn't. So it, from, a, from an innovation perspective, there was just an enormous amount going on in the kind of getting started on your wealth journey side of the equation. So think about, you know, all the neobanks, like Current, or mm -hmm. um, the robo-advisors, uh, especially at, at that time, or, you know, a dime a dozen. Lots of opportunity there, lots, uh, lots of innovation. Where there wasn't innovation was on the other end of the market. It was where complexity started to rear its head, where uh, mm -hmm. financial advisors usually stepped in to help guide their clients in, in, uh, along, you know, the more more complicated straits of managing mm -hmm. a, a larger wealth, and that's um, if you looked at the technology that they were using, it, you know it could have been built in in 2003, and, and it, it really was not innovating at the same pace mm -hmm. that the rest of the market seemed to be. So there was a gap. There was a gap in the market yeah. uh, for that uh, segment of the I guess customers or consumers who are more complexity, uh, more complexity with their wealth. That's right. And so while I was seeing that from my end, and uh, Brad, my co-founder, was also seeing it from, from his end. So uh, Brad, his story real quick, he was a, um, 
uh, a wealth manager, well, early story. He grew up in, in uh, Georgia for the most part, um, joined the Army, West Point uh, Army, then uh, it's an engineer by training. That's so right. naturally he went to MIT as well. Uh, we passed each other in business school, but didn't really know each other there as it turns out. Um, and uh, following business school, he went to work for, for Goldman in their uh, private wealth group as a wealth manager. So he, um, he sat in that seat, and saw firsthand just how challenging it was to use the technology that was available to him to actually drive his business. For the most part, it was a phone, a business card, and going to knock on doors. That's it. Yeah. And uh, so he, being the engineer that he is, started to write code uh, to automate a lot of the processes that he was going through. Uh, and I think his, his group kind of caught wind. They noticed that he wasn't out knocking on doors and going to meetings and all that sort of stuff at the same pace. But he was still successful, and he was still bringing in assets, which was kind of the core part of his job. And so they asked, you know, can you do this more broadly? Mm -hmm. And he started to uh, take what he had begun to build for himself on his you know, la laptop computer, and then uh, bring it to the entire private wealth group at, at Goldman, ultimately, mm -hmm. the team of data scientists and engineers. Yeah, um, I remember I met uh, both of you guys. There were several topics that came up. Um, the segment of the market that has more complex needs, the wealth transfer that's going to happen over the next maybe 25, 30 years mm -hmm. in the United States. It would be great to educate us a little bit about that significant wealth transfer that's ahead of us. And then the third portion of it is that the core values of the next generation investors are quite different. Mm -hmm and what people are looking for are very different. Talk to us about all those three uh, topics. Uh, so, so incredible macro trends that, are, that kind of serve as a, a bit of a tailwind uh, mm -hmm. for us. So you talked about the uh, kind of generational wealth transfer that's about to happen, right? Uh, we have, uh, most wealth right now is concentrated in the, uh, the baby boomer and silent generation. Uh, so you know, folks generally who are 65 and older. Um, and that's just beginning to pass to the next generation, uh, not only Gen Xers, but, uh, but the millennials that are following them. Uh, over the course of the uh, next 10 years, by the end of the decade, mm -hmm. uh, millennials, for instance, are going to grow in their, their wealth share uh, from about uh, $5 trillion to closer to 30. You know, that's, that's They're going to inherit $25 trillion. It's, uh, and of course, they're also in their prime earning years as well. So they're just beginning to make... Uh, make Not only they, uh, they got to inherit significant wealth, they're at the prime of their productivity as wealth creators themselves. That's right. So, you know, there's this huge transfer that's happening. They're just entering their peak earning years. They just are coming out of the, uh, you know, the debt that has mired them for, you know, uh, for the last, you know, decade or so. Mm -hmm. um, so, and they're starting to face different problems that they, uh, that they have problems that, you know, where they have families now. So what do you do from an insurance perspective? How do you think about, you know, trust and estate planning? Mm -hmm. um, and of course, how do you manage and invest the, the dollars that you're making and inheriting? Uh, and that, you know, and think about the problems are a little different for our generation uh, from the last as well. It's a lot more equity comp uh, that's, that's um, common now in, in pay packages, especially at, you know, large tech companies mm -hmm. or startup tech companies. That's, um, you know, that's a problem that, um, you know, that a problem, a, a good problem. Opportunity, I yeah, should say. <laughs> that, um, that many of their parents didn't, didn't face and didn't have to uh, need advice on. That's where, you know, a wealth advisor can be very helpful. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so, so there's a generational transfer of wealth coming. Uh, but the industry is not primed for that at all. Mm -hmm. uh, the average age of an advisor, a financial advisor, is about 60. Is that right? Yeah. That's years. incredible. I didn't realize that. Yeah. And they're not retiring very quickly either. So it's only getting older, uh, mostly because it's very easy to continue uh, not doing a whole lot for, for your clients. So um, anyway, there, there's this big opportunity uh, for, for millennials to, in, to inherit wealth, but they're not really in a place where they want a guy who's going to, and it's usually a white guy, who is going to retire in five, 10 years, somewhere around that time frame? they want somebody who's going to grow with them, who's facing the same problems that they are and who understands a very different, um, you know, different path to wealth. Several other questions. Uh, one, 
do you believe that uh, Father, Father and the platform you've built is going to create more inclusion in society? Can more people participate uh, because you are a technology platform and there's no barrier? You don't know my color. You don't know my gender. Sure. Right. How, how does that, um, how, in your mind, I mean, is that part of your efforts? Um, I'm going to answer that in a couple of different ways. Uh, so first from kind of the pure technology angle and then from, you know, from a, you know, who we looked at to work with and hire. Uh, so from a, from a pure technology perspective, we call ourselves a digital family office. That's our, our North Star. And the reason that we call ourselves that is because uh, if, if you think about what an ideal wealth situation is, it is to have a whole bunch of people running around and making sure that every aspect of your client, of your, of your financial life, is, mm-hmm. it just works. Most of that, though, most of the running around aspect of it can be accomplished with technology. It, it doesn't demand a, a huge number of people. So when we, when we lean into that, when we start to develop the technology that can automate many of those processes, that means that we can bring it down from something that is only accessible to billionaires to, uh, you know, to a much broader mm-hmm. swath of the population. Um, and as we, uh, you know, we want to build a platform that can accommodate uh, both you know, very wealthy people uh, and in building the tools that, that work for those very wealthy people, we also have this fantastic suite of tools that work for just about everybody because the primitives of, uh, mm-hmm. of those tools, they're, they're accounts, there's money movement. It is, it's all just kind of uh, the, the basic blocking and tackling of managing anybody's personal financial life. So that, uh, that gives us the opportunity to bring a, a fantastic experience to a broader swath of people. Mm-hmm. Um, on the, uh, you know, from an inclusion perspective, uh, w- you know, we spend a lot of time uh, looking for and, and, uh, and hiring folks that represent the, you know, the kind of broad swath of America. Um, the, you know, the fi- uh, finance industry, especially the wealth management industry, you know, has historically been you know, uh, g- generally white males. So there's not as much representation already out there as there, there needs to be. Uh, we, we look for it and we, we actively seek it out because mm-hmm. I think it's really important to look like the client base that we uh, we want to serve and you know what America looks like now is a little bit different than it looked like 50 years ago or 30 years ago. Mm-hmm. Well, that uh, talk about uh, the firm, um, how it's grown, what's the culture looks like. I mean, you've built this business through the pandemic years. And tell us about that. It's, I, I like to say that we were born in the pandemic because uh, officially yeah. we. Uh, we started managing client money on uh, in April of 2020. So that's right. Just as it was crashing down, and that was a very scary time. You, if you remember, I do. Uh, we you know we, we were worried about you know whether anybody was going to buy anything, uh, let alone take big risk with their financial lives, uh, or, um, or or trust a startup to you know manage. You know, you know, what is everything that they'd ever built and, and uh, accumulated from a financial perspective? That's a really scary proposition. We weren't sure if it was going to work. Um, but uh, I think from that, you know, that first uh, client that we, that we won, who you know, was a cold LinkedIn outreach, that gave us at least the confidence that something was there. So what is it going to look like five years from now? Uh, five years What's from now. What's the vision? What, what is your vision uh, for the firm uh, five years from now? So what we're trying to build is the best platform for advisors and clients alike. Uh, we, you know, we're, we're a little different from most uh, wealth management firms in the sense that we believe it's very important to own our tech stack rather than to outsource it or to patch over you know, code that was originally written in the 70s for mainframe computers. Um, when you get close to the metal of partner institutions, that allows you to, to do a, a couple things. First, it allows you to pursue a, a zero op strategy. So we cut out a lot of the uh, points of friction in actually working with clients. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, no more paper forms, ideally. Um, it allows us to use data to deliver a really fantastic client experience. And it allows us to deliver the world's, the, kind of the best of the world's financial products to our client base. We're not very restricted in what we can, what we can deliver there. We're not, uh, we're not trying to push our own proprietary products at anybody, for instance. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, that's, a, that's an important 
-hmm. aspect of your model and your philosophy that you are a technology platform and you're agnostic, you want to bring the best solution to the clients, essentially. That's right. I mean, think about it from your perspective. What's the ideal? You, uh, in a perfect world, everything would be available in one place. You would know that you're getting the best of everything. You uh, wouldn't be captive to a single, you know, a single loan provider or a single insurance provider or whatever it happens. I want choices, to. yes. Yeah. You want choices and you want to know that you're getting the best. I want choices, I want transparency, I want reliability. There you go. Oh, very good. Now, your thoughts, advice to the entrepreneurs, what are the things that um, you've learned that you want to share? The things that you would encourage people to do more of and uh, you know the mistakes to avoid? <laughs> uh, I'm sure there's plenty of mistakes. Um, I, I, I tell you, I think one of the most important things is to uh, tackle a problem that you're, you really care a lot about. Like I've always been a, a geek about personal finance. Like I, I, I tell a story, I was, uh, my family took a cruise, I was in college, and while everybody else was reading kind of beach books, I was reading, you know, uh, uh, Burton Malkiel. Like <laughs> it's a, um, it's, I've just been a geek about it for a very long time. I love this, uh, the space that we're in. Um, and you have to because you're going to spend all, you know, all of your time on this problem uh, for you know, probably quite a bit of time. Um, so having that passion, I think, is really great mm -hmm. to fall back on. And then having a fantastic co-founder, I think, is, is yeah. important and one that you know, provides that complementary skill set to, you know, to what you bring to the table. Uh, I can't imagine doing this alone. Yeah. And uh, having Brad there has been, has been tremendous. Um, as far as mistakes to avoid, um, I, I think, I mean, you're going to be like everybody's going to make mistakes. The the best thing that you can do is to be you know to be data driven, to experiment, and to try and learn from them. Honestly, if you think about you know any hero story, it's kind of boring without a struggle. All you're right. going to have a struggle. Well, again, thank you so much for the time you spent with me today. Oh, it's been a pleasure, and I'm looking forward to watching your success. I mean, it's incredible what you've done. Thank you for again joining me today. Oh, thank you for having me, Bobby. Really appreciate it.